Welcome to Back Talk Podcast, episode 94. Today's episode is being optimized for YouTube, for viewing on YouTube. And uh, this is one a new podcast style where it's more of a lecture. So today I wanted to deep dive with you all on how to train your puppy. Okay, so today we're going to be deep diving on how to train your puppy, which includes three main topics. One's going to be puppy selection, which is act- actually selecting a puppy if you're able to do that, right? Not all of us are going to be able to do that. But, you know, if you're getting a puppy from a breeder, you should be able to select uh, the puppy that you want out of that litter. Um, But if you're adopting a puppy, you don't always get to have the ideal selection and that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. But we're just going to discuss that. We're also going to talk about puppy raising. This is primarily going to be for breeders, okay? And if you're looking to get a dog from a breeder, this puppy raising section that we're going to be talking about that is going to be something that you can have that knowledge and you could take it with you as you go to vet breeders and select a breeder that you're going to choose a puppy from. Okay. And last but not least, we're going to deep dive into the priorities of puppy training. Okay. And a, a follow on podcast from this one that's coming out in a couple of weeks is going to deep dive on how to train your dog, the ultimate dog training guide. So that this is just going to be a great prerequisite to that next podcast coming out shortly, okay? So if you're following along on YouTube, you're going to get the visual as well as the audio. If you're listening on a podcast platform, you're obviously getting the audio, okay? Um, but this will be posted on the Pack Talk podcast YouTube channel and the canine revolution dog training youtube channel okay so we're going to jump to the next slide here which is slide number two all right puppy selection so i'm just going to step through these slides and we're going to talk about it as we go okay but special note always make sure that you're purchasing a puppy from a legitimate breeder do not support mass breeding or backyard breeding okay we've all seen these posts that get sent out on social media about the backyard breeders the mass breeding If you've seen some of those pictures that are happening, I mean, some of these places are just horrific, okay? So you definitely don't want to support that. You want to make sure that you're purchasing a puppy from a legitimate breeder. That's going to help keep healthy breeding in place, all right? If you are supporting a mass breeder or a backyard breeder, you're going to support poor bloodlines and, you know, bad situations for dogs in the future. So keep that in mind, okay? Obviously, backyard breeders are going to be cheaper, but... That's going to come with some potential health problems, uh, probable health problems, and uh, probable, you know, genetic bloodline problems, okay? If you're adopting a puppy from a rescue, again, like we talked about earlier, you may not get your ideal selection, and that's totally okay, all right? Um, A lot of the things we're going to talk about, training is going to help us tremendously with behavioral problems or other problems that we can encounter with puppies. And just because you adopt a puppy from a rescue doesn't mean it's not going to be a great dog, okay? So don't uh, take that off the table when you're looking at getting a puppy, okay? Do keep in mind that a puppy is going to reflect the genetics of the parents. So the parents are going to be the best indicator of how that puppy is going to be. So when you're selecting a puppy, when you're going to a breeder, you want to be able to see those parents. And, you know, a lot of times breeders will uh, use a stud dog, which is the male. They'll use a stud dog. So that stud may not be around when you go to view the breeder, but you should be able to get some kind of video of that dog or photos at least to where you can see them. But, uh, you know, whenever you go visit your breeder, make sure you're looking at the mother at least, ideally looking at both parents. The way those parents are behaving is going to give you the best indicator of how your puppy's going to behave, okay? So if you have parents that are insecure or scared of things or nervous about things, your puppy could have those traits as well. So just keep that in mind. But again, with those, with that going on, you know, training is going to help with those behavioral issues, Okay. Like we just mentioned on the slideshow here, dogs with anxiety, insecurity, dominance, etc., those traits are going to pass on, but proper training can help with the behavioral issues, okay? And then last uh, big ticket item on this slide right here, puppy tests. There's a lot of conversation about puppy tests from people that are getting puppies. Just keep in mind that uh, there's a lot of puppy tests out there, but they're not going to be a good indicator of how your puppy will be. Okay, a lot of the puppies 
behavioral aspects or characteristics can be influenced by us through the way of raising them and training them, which is what we're talking about today. So instead of worrying too much about a puppy test, I would be focused on assessing the, the parents, selecting a legitimate breeder, and then implementing proper raising and training procedures, okay? So we're going to go to the next slide here, slide number three. All right, so the first section I want to talk about when it comes to puppy raising is the prenatal period. So this is before the puppy's even born, all right? And it does play a factor in our puppy's long-term uh, behaviors and success in life. So the first thing we want to do is keep mama dog stress very low, all right? Prenatal stress can affect the puppy's development. It can create more fearful puppies and reduce learning ability, produce extremes of behavior, and increase the individual emotional states. All right, so again, keeping that mama as low stress as possible, right? A lot of legitimate breeders are going to have their different areas set up for their different moms that are carrying puppies, right? Those, those places should be at a comfortable temperature for the mamas. The mamas should be getting the proper exercise and mental exercise on a daily basis while they're pregnant, right? That doesn't stop. And then when they're having birth, they should be comfortable as well. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So we want to keep mama dog comfortable with proper nutrition and exercise during the pregnancy, making sure she's getting enough protein, getting her daily walks, etc. Again, choosing a proper breeder is really going to set you up for success in this realm right here. But with this knowledge, you can go to a breeder, you can ask the appropriate questions of what they're doing with their mothers, okay? Remember that the goal is to set the puppy up for success in life. So we want to make the puppy as confident and capable as possible to achieve the goal of wherever they're going to be at. Now, we all have different goals with our dogs. We get dogs for different reasons. Your dog could be just a pet dog. You could be getting a working dog that's going to be you know, some type of sport dog or police dog or something like that. You could get a service dog, right? You could be getting a dog to be a service dog, so far and so forth, okay? So be ready to take appropriate action before your puppy's born. And we're keeping the prenatal period uh, in front of mind as we're doing this, okay? Next slide here, slide number four. All right, we're talking about puppy raising from zero to two weeks of age is our first kind of time frame we're looking at. During this time frame, the mother is the overwhelming influence on the puppy's development. Okay, so again, before the puppies were born, you know, that mother's stress level is playing a big role in the puppy's development in the womb. And then as they're born, the mother is still the overwhelming influence on the puppy's development, which is something that's just common sense, right? The puppies are going to imprint themselves on the mother, and the mother is imprinting behaviors into the minds of the pups. So they're already observing. They're already paying attention subconsciously. They don't even know they're doing it. And what she's doing is how they're going to start behaving, which is why when we're selecting a breeder, you know, we're looking at those parents that they have, okay? Another big point here is we want to begin early handling of the puppies, this is going to introduce the puppies to mild stresses, which have a number of benefits for them later in life. So some of the benefits are going to be that the puppies are more calm, they're more confident, they're more relaxed, they have greater cognitive abilities, they have influence over body growth and development, reduced emotionality, and it increases the dog's ability to resist health risks in life. Okay, so something as simple as early Mild stresses in their life is going to provide them with a bunch of benefits that are going to continue throughout their life, okay? So we def this is going to be a recurring theme throughout this discussion, so it's definitely something that you want to pay attention to and be ready for, and also asking your breeder about. Now, when we're talking about early handling of the puppies, it could be something as simple as picking them up, holding them, making them a little bit uncomfortable, you know, because they're used to being right next to their mother, all tucked up next to her with the other puppies as well, nice and warm. So we pull them away from that for a, for a minute or so. It doesn't need to be anything crazy, but we pull them away from that for a little bit. They start getting a little bit cold. They might start whining a little bit. We're holding them in, the, in our hands. We might turn them around. We might mess with their paws. And then we put them right back uh, next to their mother. Okay. So again, 
you're not doing this for an extreme period of time. You're just picking them up. You, again, it takes a minute or less to do all this. You put them back down, and that's going to set them up for success big time uh, throughout the rest of their life, okay? So talk to your breeder about doing that um, whenever you're talking to breeders and you're interviewing breeders, okay? So let's jump to the next slide here, slide number five. We're still talking about the two- to four-week range, okay? <clears throat> I wanted to put this in here so you guys had some knowledge on when the sensory abilities of the puppies are coming online, okay? So as soon as they're born zero weeks old, their head already has touch ability, which means that they can feel things with their head. This is why puppies are moving around, they're squirming, they're using their head, their nose to figure out where their mother's at so they can begin to get milk from her, okay? They already have taste, they already have smell, okay? So already at birth, they've got these three things. Now, depending on what you're training for, you want to start using these senses to your advantage, right? So smell is one thing. A lot of people are going to be getting a dog for some type of scent work or nose detection. So you're going to start imprinting those scents onto your puppy already at this age, okay? At two weeks old, we've got their eyes are open, their ear canals are open, and they're starting to react to sounds. Their front legs have touch ability, so not just their heads. At three weeks old, the puppies are starting to stumble around. We've all seen videos or we've seen live puppies where they're starting to move around. They fall over, whatever. They're starting to do that kind of stuff. Then at four weeks old, the puppies are going to start reacting to light and moving objects, uh, much like an adult brain would, uh, the adult dog brain. They've got brain development. The puppy's ready for cognitive challenges by four weeks old, okay? So one of the reasons why I put all this in here at this point of the uh, presentation is because as these different sensory abilities start coming online, you want to start adding a little bit of stress onto those sensory abilities. We talked about already picking them up, you know, holding them for a minute, putting them back down, right? That's, that's the first thing we're going to be doing. But once the puppy starts stumbling around, I might start putting some things in their area that they got to crawl over, or start trying to crawl over, okay? Or different surfaces that they ne may need to start getting used to. So if their uh, weaning area doesn't have like a slick surface in there, I might put a slick surface because that's uh, honestly one of the things that makes a lot of dogs nervous is moving on slick floors, okay? And then once the puppy hits four weeks old, they're reacting to light, they're reacting to moving objects, things like that. I'm going to start stressing with those things a little bit as well, okay? Again, we're going to continue mild stresses for all senses available, right? So some examples of what you could be doing or what the breeder could be doing. Number one, you could be doing various sounds and noises while the puppies are eating, right? So let's say the puppies are eating, you can start vacuums around them, right? You can put like some kind of speaker in there with different noises going on, you know, things like that. Uh, the next thing you could do is moving and various objects for puppies to observe, investigate. So, you know, moving things around in their area, you can set something into their area for them to come over and check out and investigate. Again, a vacuum is just a good example. Uh, you could just set a vacuum in there. You could turn it on. You could leave it off. Let the puppies go check it out. You could set something else in there like a mop bucket or something like that. You could take some children's toys, put them over there. You know, just different things. If you have specific things that you want to make sure your dog can operate around, you would put that in there as well. Okay. Uh, like we talked about earlier, various terrain for the puppies to walk around or over. Again, pieces of slick floor material you could put some uh some blankets in there they got to crawl over those you could put uh some like an upside down <coughs> small bucket or something for them to crawl over you can put bricks in there again there's there's endless opportunities here you just want to change up what they're having to work through as much as possible so again we're adding those mild stresses okay and then cognitive challenges uh, with new environmental factors, loud, scary noises. We already talked about vacuums. Okay, I think vacuums are great to incorporate with puppies at a very early age, all right? Transitioning over, under, through things. So you could build like a little tunnel in their area. They have to go through that. You could make them, uh, you know, put some kind of 
five gallon bucket in there on its side where they go into that it starts rolling a little bit you know you could put some kind of dark area that they can go into come back out of those types of things various floor surfaces we already mentioned the slick floors but you know you also want to get them used to things like grass sand carpet stairs if you can a lot of dogs have some apprehension about stairs we want to avoid that so you could also do like you know set up some bricks in like a stair-like fashion set up some pieces of wood in a stair-like fashion to simulate stairs until you're able to actually get them around stairs okay so just some things to think about all right slide number six still two to four weeks old continuing that discussion all right at towards the end of this period litter mates uh their influence is going to start increasing so the mother's influence is still strong but the litter mate influence is now starting to increase okay litter mate interactions are going to be a very important part for proper development and social interaction of puppies so we want them to be interacting with their litter mates they're going to be learning social behavior play behavior uh, dominant submission. They're going to start learning that from their mother. We'll talk about that here in a second, but they're also going to learn about it from their litter mates, learning how to interact with other dogs. So the litter mates being together and their interactions is, is one of those things that's very important. Okay. The mother begins to wean her puppies off the milk somewhere around four to five weeks old. So she's going to start to teach the puppies about dominance and submissive behavior when she's going through this weaning process. And the way that the mother handles the interaction of weaning uh, can influence future behavior, okay? So just think about it like this. Puppies from litters with more harsh mothers tend to be less social to people. So if a mother is overbearing on her puppies when she's weaning them, overcorrecting them, those types of things, that's too harsh for the puppies, okay? Puppies from litters with mothers that don't punish their pups also result in puppies that are more difficult to train later. Wow, I mean, that's a heavy hitter because you got a lot of people out there and they're in the purely positive realm and all they want to do is reward, reward, reward or never, you know, correct for anything, you know, that's going to result in a puppy that's more difficult to train later, okay? So you want to have a balanced mother. She can give uh, effective correction when she needs to. She knows when to do that and she's not letting them get away with just anything, okay? Uh, but she's not overcorrecting them, right? So... One of those things where you got to figure that out, ask your breeder, you know, how does the, how does the mother do with weaning puppies? If it's the first, if it's like a first time mother, you might not know before you get into that situation, but hopefully even if that's happening, an experienced breeder can help that mother learn not to be over correcting or under correcting. Okay. So it's got to be a balanced act with the puppies during this time. All right, moving on next slide. Number seven we got puppy raising four to 12 weeks old. Okay. So we've left the two to four week range. We're now in the next range, which is four to 12 weeks old of puppy raising. Okay. So play activity in the litter has many functions, which we talked about on the last slide. First play activity will bond puppies. It will teach communication skills. It's going to indicate what dogs are more dominant or submissive, and it's going to promote proper mental, physical adaptation, while teaching problem solving okay so again this is the importance of having your litter mates of your puppy having their litter mates okay but not all puppies are that lucky there are single puppy litters there's also puppies which we'll often find in rescues where you know they were born in the woods somewhere or they were born out in a remote location the mother passed away for whatever reason or got taken by somebody now these puppies are by themselves right Either they stay together or they separate. Now a puppy is completely by itself, which is unfortunate, right? But sometimes it does happen. Now these puppies need good homes too, right? So puppies that do not get to play with litter mates, they can become excessively or abnormally attached to humans and fearful of other dogs. I've seen this a number of times. They can develop reactivity or aggression towards other dogs, and they can develop excessive insecurities. And most of the dogs that I've dealt with that have extreme insecurity they're in this situation where you know they were born in a remote location the mother wasn't there or the mother died shortly after they were born and now the puppy's figuring things out on their own okay remember that socialization should be emphasized and ongoing okay so we've already started socialization before 
this time period, right? Because we're starting to introduce mild stresses. We're starting to introduce things to the puppies for them to explore and investigate. But now we're taking an even harder stance on that. We're focusing on that, okay? So think kids, vacuums, again, with the vacuums. We're talking about vacuums a lot. Veterinarians, I mean, you don't, you, you definitely don't want to be skipping over your vacuum training with a puppy, right? Veterinarians, grooming. So you got to prep your puppy for those things, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Other suitable animals, which is going to be your respectful dogs, your respectful cats. Not all cats are respectful. We know that, right? Uh, street noises, you want to get them used to that. Cars, bikes, etc. Loud trucks, uh, fireworks. Go ahead and start a slow exposure to these types of things. Lawn equipment, you know, you got your lawnmower. Some dogs love to attack the lawnmower. Some dogs hate the lawnmower. So you want your dog to be neutral to that, okay? Slick floors, like we talked about earlier, climbing over and under obstacles. Notice a lot of these things keep coming up. That's because they're super important, all right? Next slide, slide number eight. Special note for the four to 12 week, a uh, four to 12 week range. Standard medical advice for puppies is that they should not be exposed to a number of environments until all shots are completed which is gonna be around 17 weeks of age. It's your decision whether you will begin socialization at four weeks old or wait for the vaccinations to be completed. So keep that in mind. If you wait until 17 weeks old, you may miss out on a lot of this important timing with socialization. But of course, there's a lot you can do within the safety of your home or your property, all right? So just keep in mind, we're talking about the four to 12 week range at around eight weeks old, your puppy should be coming home to you. Shouldn't be coming home to you before eight weeks old. If it is, that's a red flag, right? If they're, if your breeder's trying to send your puppy to you at six weeks old, that's a little bit too early. So eight to 10 weeks is the ideal time frame for that puppy to start coming home to you. Now, with that being said, you know, all vets are going to tell you, uh, don't, don't expose your puppy to different environments until they've got all their shots, which, you know, that is one of the, the risks that you're taking is that, hey, we're being exposed to different viruses or germs or things like that. What I would say is, because I know how important socialization is. So what I would say is try to balance that out. Don't take your dog somewhere that's very dog populated, like a dog park, for example. Uh, take your dog somewhere where you're still getting that safe socialization, uh, but you're not increasing unnecessary exposure to bad things that could harm your puppy. Okay. So that's what I would recommend. And, uh, that's what I would do because I know how important the socialization piece is. So, and these sessions don't have to be long. You can take your puppy out to a local park real quick for about 15 minutes Get them exposed to people walking around. Get them exposed to, you know, someone playing tennis or pickleball. That's the new thing these days. So, you know, and then after that, just take your puppy back home. <coughs> so keep that in mind. But socialization should be a priority. All right, next slide, slide number nine. Uh, puppies should be going to their homes between 8 to 10 weeks old. I already mentioned that. Just remember that if your breeder's trying to send them home earlier than 8 weeks old, that is a red flag. We should avoid that if possible. All right, next slide, slide number 10, we're going to recap the puppy selection and raising, okay? So early life experiences place a significant role in the development of the puppy and the dog. Remember, we want to select appropriate parents, which means selecting an appropriate breeder and then visiting with them, visiting the parents, because those parents are going to give you the best indicator of the dog that you will be getting, okay? Alleviate prenatal stress. That's going to be more on your breeder than you, but a good thing to note and a good thing to be talking to your breeder about. And then we're going to use the zero to 12 weeks of life to the best interest of the development of the puppy with the goal to set the puppy up for success as they mature. Now, with that being said, again, this comes down to your selection as a, as a dog owner, getting a dog from a breeder, because from zero to eight weeks, they're going to be with your breeder. You might have the opportunity to visit with them for, you know, a day or a day or so here or there, but that's nothing compared to the full eight weeks. So make sure you're asking your breeder those questions, right? What are they doing during these time frames? Are they doing mild stressing? What are they exposing the puppies to? And then as soon as you get that puppy, boom, now it's on you 
to start implementing that stuff yourself. Okay. All right. Next slide. Slide number 11. So up to this point, we've been talking about in general, what's happening with our puppy or considerations for the puppy before they come home. Now they're coming home. So we have to make sure we have a plan ready before we actually bring them home. Okay. And preferably we start to have that plan built out before we even are going to interview breeders or selecting a breeder. Okay. So keep in mind that puppy training is officially starting when you bring your puppy home. As far as you're concerned, remember that what your breeder's doing before you get your puppy is also either going to help you or hinder you long term with your puppy training. Okay. But your puppy training is starting when you bring your puppy home. So what do you want to be doing with your dog? Is it a pet dog? Is it a sport dog? Is it a protection dog? The detection dog, search and rescue, which will be similar to detection, uh, service dog, you know, what do you want to do with your dog? What's your goal? Okay. The majority of a puppy's success is based on their early life experiences. There's no luck with your puppy, only training. Okay. What you're doing day in and day out with your puppy is going to help you or hinder you and your long-term success with your goal. Okay. And just keep in mind what your puppy is practicing is what they're going to continue as an adult dog. Also what your adult dog is practicing is what they're going to keep doing. Okay. So don't think that behaviors are going to magically change as time goes on. All right, let's go to the next slide here. Slide number 12. So first, we're, we're talking about a plan. We've started thinking about our goals with our puppy. Now we need to have some equipment. We need to prepare equipment before our puppy comes home. You don't get equipment when you're picking up your puppy, right? So don't pick up your puppy. Stop by PetSmart. Get all your equipment with your new puppy and then bring it to the house. Have your house set up before you get your puppy, okay? So the first thing is a crate, also known as a kennel, okay? So... For this, my personal recommendation is just get a simple wire crate. You can order them on Amazon. The ones I get off of Amazon are going to be the Midwest Life Stages kennels. Uh, do the single door with the divider, okay? And then inside that crate, I'll get a special uh, bed. It's called a Primo Pad, P-R-I-M-O Pad. You can go to primopad.com to get those. And they size them right to your specific kennel. So if you got a 36 inch kennel, for example, they'll give you a Primo pad that fits in there. But, you know, basically you get the wire kennel. I would get the Primo pad. That's going to provide some cushion in there. It's also coated in a, a vinyl type material. So it's super easy to clean and it can keep it comfortable in there. Okay. So you get that kennel. Uh, you got other kennel options. If you're looking for something else, there's aluminum crates, there's plastic crates. I just happen to be a fan of the wire crates. And, uh, you know, there is some consideration we need to have as far as when our, when our training comes into play about having one crate versus two crates, or maybe one crate and an exercise pen. I definitely recommend one or the other. I recommend either having two crates or one crate and an exercise pen. And the reason for that is we're going to have one crate that's our basic like nighttime stay in your kennel type crate when we go to work stuff. Then we have another crate or an exercise pen in our general family area where we can have our puppy hang out in when they're not being directly supervised. Okay, so we'll talk more about that later. But I'm a big fan of the one crate and the exercise pen option but I have done two crate options before with other people, okay? The exercise pens that I like, you can go on Amazon. You can find, find the wire exercise pens for dogs. I don't really like those. I normally will go to the, uh, the children's section of either Amazon or some kind of store, and they have these heavy-duty uh, ch child X pens where it's basically a, a big plastic fence thing that's mobile, it folds up, it unfolds, you connect it together. It's heavy duty. Uh, they use them for kids, right? And uh, I just get one of those for the puppies and set that up, adjust it for whatever you're doing with that puppy. You can change the, the format of how it's shaped and all that kind of stuff. So that's what I recommend for an exercise pen, okay? But again, the reason why we have both 
is because we have our one crate that's going to be where it always is, where the puppy's going to stay at at nighttime and when we're not home. And then we have the exercise pen, for example, for when we're not supervising the puppy, but it's hanging out in the house with us, okay? Other piece of equipment that we need to think about, collar. Okay, the puppy's going to be growing pretty quick, so we need something that needs to be pretty adjustable. Some options could be a slip lead, which is like a collar and leash combination. You've also got a martingale collar. You can get a harness, right? <clears throat> so for me with puppies, I usually go with a slip lead or I'll just use a harness with the puppy, not worry about a collar at the time, okay, until they get a little bit older. And uh, once the puppy's about 15 weeks old or a little bit older, I'll start using a fur saver uh, training collar. And that's basically just like a metal chain looking collar. And uh, that's what I'll be using after that point, okay? Leash, I prefer a five or six foot leather leash. I like the six foot myself, five foot for people that are a little bit shorter, okay? You could use any leash you wanted to, that's just my preference. Uh, drag line. All right. This is not something that's common knowledge, but a drag line is basically a piece of a leash with no handle on it. And the reason why we have that is because when we're training with our puppy around the house, we're going to allow them to move around themselves a little bit at a certain point. And so we want to be able to have a leash or a drag line on them. That way, if we are working on our potty training and we realize that our puppy's trying to go potty in the house, we can easily grab that drag line and guide them outside versus having to run, grab a leash, run back to the puppy and hook it up. And by that point, they've already pooped or peed in the house. Okay. So <clears throat> a drag line, something I highly recommend. You can take an old leash. You can cut the handle off. I like a super light leash. I don't like anything that's like super heavy for this. So those, those old school nylon, really thin leashes can work pretty good for this. You can cut the handle off. Then you can burn the end of it with the lighter to, to kind of cinch it down so it's not fraying everywhere. Or you can make a homemade drag line, which is you just go to your local hardware store. You buy some 550 parachute cord. You get like a small snap clip from their just clip section. Put those two together. You cut the parachute cord at the length that you want it at, which could be four feet or six feet for a drag line. And then you use that, okay? <clears throat> Good options there. Next slide, number 13, we're still talking about equipment. Next piece would be bait bag. So this is what we're gonna hold our training food in for our luring and our just training in general. And then let's say we're between training sessions or overnight, I'm not gonna keep that bait bag out on the counter or anything with fresh food rewards in it because those will get kind of raunchy. So I'll put that in the freezer. I'll just put the whole bait bag in the freezer. It preserves everything really good. Take it out the next day. We're ready to start our training, okay? The next thing we need to be thinking about equipment-wise is toys and shoes, okay? These can be advantageous for us as we're working with our puppy. But we need to make sure that the toys and shoes are developmentally appropriate which means we don't want a chew that's made for an adult dog for an eight week old puppy. That'll be too difficult for them. It won't satisfy them. Okay. So we need nice soft chews when they're young and then slowly make them a little bit tougher as they get older. Okay. We want some toys for the puppy's self entertainment, which means if we put them in the X pen, we want to have some toys and stuff in there that they can entertain themselves on. Then we want to have toys that are specifically for interactions with us. And that's going to most likely be for most people like a chuck it ball, you know, like a fetch scenario or a tug where we're playing tug with our puppy. Okay. Also chews, uh, natural animal parts are my preferred types of chews. And I'll put those in the self entertainment area, like the X pen with the puppy. So think about like pig ears, cow tracheas, bully sticks, these types of things. Okay. I only get natural animal parts for my chews. All right. Other equipment, cots and beds. We don't want the puppy to get used to chewing on cots or beds. So Caranda beds are super heavy duty pet cots. They're, they're not going to be chewed easily. So that could be something you look at getting. You can get those on Amazon and then uh, Primo pads. We already talked about that for in the kennel. Okay. Uh, but the reason why I like getting a cot early is because long term in my training, I'm going to be teaching that puppy to go to that cot, lay down and stay there automatically, right? That's what a lot of people call the place command 
We call it the spot command. Doesn't really matter what you call it. It's the behavior overall that matters. So I'm going to get a cot and start exposing the puppy to that as we go forward. All right, moving to the next slide here. More equipment, food, right? So we've got food considerations. We've got training food versus mealtime food, okay? So training food must be soft. It must be palatable, easy to use, easy for the puppy to eat, and it must stay together. So some of the training food that I use for the most part, that's going to be Happy Howie meat rolls or beef hot dogs cut to one half inch pieces. And the one half inch is one of those uh, sizes that fits most puppies. Okay, you might have to go a little bit smaller depending on your breed. All right. For food, mealtime food, find a food that your puppy enjoys. Raw diets are most likely going to be the best for the puppy and the dog, but they can be a little bit expensive and hard to handle at times. So other options could be, you know, like a from kibble or a Stella and Chewy uh, raw blend kibble, a puppy formula, of course, with the puppies. And then you could add some canine super supplements in there, which we recommend, and that's going to help mimic the raw diet and fill any gaps in their nutritional profiles. Okay. Also, I do recommend consulting with a canine nutritionist if you want to deep dive more into the nutrition aspect of what you're feeding your puppy. And we did interview one on episode 14 of the podcast, um, so you can check that out if you'd like. All right, then the last thing for equipment is going to be any goal-specific equipment that you might need to be thinking about. So depending on your goals, you may want additional equipment like touch pads, foot targets, hurdles, jumps, agility equipment, protection training tugs, remote collars, long lines, retrieval equipment, sport competition tools, etc. There's a lot of different things out there depending on what you're doing. Whatever your goal is, start acquiring that equipment, start exposing your puppy to it, start a training progression that gets your puppy onto that equipment like they're going to be long term. All right, next slide here, going to slide number 15. Very important concept we're going to talk about right now, compartmentalization. So this is what I recommend for everyone with puppies, but especially if you're going to be doing like a sport dog, protection dog, police dog, anything like that, you want to get this compartmentalization down, okay? Compartmentalization basically means we have two zones in our life with our puppy. We have a low arousal or a calm zone. We have a high arousal or an excitable zone. So basically, in the low arousal zone, we do not do anything crazy to increase our energy levels there, okay? So generally, this is going to be your house or your living room at least. No work or play occurs there to keep the puppy in the habit of being calm in that area. That's why we call it the low arousal zone, okay? High arousal zone, that could be your yard, could be a training area. This is where we're going to play. This is where we're going to work. We're going to do our high energy training, stuff like that. All those high energy things are going to occur there. So what happens over time is if you can maintain this, when your puppy's in your low arousal, your calm zone, they'll naturally start coming down in their energy. Okay. When you go out to your excitable or your high arousal zone, your puppy's energy state will increase. Okay. As they're getting excited about going out there and being in that area and maintaining that just helps you long-term balance out your energy. Okay. Compartmentally compartmentalizing our life with our puppy allows us to build great habits from the beginning, which helps us when they're older. So you'll thank me later if you implement that. All right. Multiple dog household. Okay, so let's talk about if we have a dog already, now we're bringing a puppy home. Ideally, for the introduction, the introduction between the dogs should be away from the house or the territory. What this looks like for most people is they have one person with their older dog, bring the older dog out to the street, they've got their puppy, and they start walking. Okay, we're not allowing physical contact before we're walking because we want the dogs to excuse me, see each other smell each other, observe each other, hear each other, all that type of stuff before they actually get to meet, okay? So we're walking, you know, the distance that you walk is just going to be dependent on your dogs, okay? And then once you walk for a distance, you can then allow physical contact and you're assessing that physical contact. Do both dogs seem comfortable? 
Is your older dog comfortable with your puppy? Is your puppy being overbearing? Is the older dog maybe going to correct your puppy, right? So based on what's happening, you might stop the physical contact by walking away from each other so they can't get to each other, then continuing your walk. The more walking and walks that you do in general, the better for bonding, okay? Obviously, for this scenario, ideally, again, you're going to have two people, one handling each dog. In the home, let's say now you got your puppy in the house, the introduction outside went good. Don't let the puppy pester the older dog, okay? A lot of puppies want to, you know, show too much attention to to older dogs or other dogs, so your puppy has to learn respect. So how are you going to not let your puppy pester the older dog? By using your X-Pen, okay, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, or using that drag line to move your puppy away from the older dog if they're being pestering to the older dog. You also want to develop your relationship with your puppy. Don't let your puppy develop a stronger relationship with your older dog than it does you, okay? We don't want your puppy to learn bad habits or bad behaviors from your older dog if those are uh, happening, okay? Moving on, next slide, slide number 17. We're talking about the crate, all right? We need our dogs comfortable in the crate. That's obvious. There may be, there probably will be noise for the first couple days at least, okay? Your puppy, think about it. Your puppy is used to being with their litter mates. They're used to being with their mother. Now they are alone. They're with you, okay? So we already switched up their environment, and now they're having to sleep alone, that type of thing. So we need to be patient. Don't fall into the trap of letting your puppy start to sleep in the bed with you. That's going to set you up for problems later, okay? We, one of the things we need is that healthy separation with our puppy, which means they're not with us all the time. So even if you're sleeping in your bed and your puppy's kennel is right next to your bed, that's still healthy separation in this scenario, okay? So get your puppy used to doing that. Get them used to operating independently, okay? Again, there's going to be some noise for the first couple of days. Just ignore that, all right? Uh, you do want to play some crate games with your puppy. This is going to help you make the crate a fun place. So what you're going to do is you're going to play games with some of your food rewards for going in and out of your kennel. So you can toss a reward in the kennel. The puppy runs in there, goes to get it. You, you have them chase your hand back out, right? So you're doing this back and forth. You're luring them into your kennel. You're, you know, luring them into different positions in their kennel, rewarding them in there, just having a good time, okay? You can also put their kennel and their X-Pen area at first, get them used to just moving around that whole area and going in and out of the kennel with toys or whatever. You can feed your puppy their meals in their crate. That's going to help them be more comfortable there. You can only give them water in the crate. That's going to help them be more comfortable there again. And then the crate should also be their resting place. So if you're put, if you're like, you know, giving your puppy some nap time throughout the day, like a lot of puppies are going to sleep when they first come home at that eight week mark, they're going to sleep, you know, for a while throughout the day. So when they're, when they're ready to rest, just put them in their kennel, let them rest there. Okay. And then again, <clears throat> Think about that low arousal, that calm zone. Keep your puppy's energy levels in the kennel in a low arousal zone, okay? Good to go with that. Next slide, number 18. We're starting to talk about management, okay? So management is how we're living with our dogs while we're working to achieve our goals, okay? So, you know, we can institute manners with management. We can solve behavioral problems with management. We don't want to impact the dog's motivation and drive, uh, when we're implementing management. Okay. Unfortunately, there's a lot of management techniques that do not take into account the dog's motivation and drive. We want to preserve that. That helps us in training. It's also good for our dog to have that. There are a lot of suppressive techniques used on dogs. Again, these can impact motivation. So don't do that. It can be a challenge to raise a polite dog, but with proper relationship, engagement, and management, we can properly mold our puppies. Okay. So that's what we're doing with management overall. Next slide, number 19, we're going to be talking through the key aspects of management. So here's the main aspects we're going to be going through. One, we're going to be talking about use of a crate, which we've already touched on. Two, housebreaking or potty training. Okay. Three, healthy separation. Four, motivation. And five, leash walking. 
So let's get into it. Next slide, number 20. Using a crate, right? A crate is going to help keep your dog out of trouble while you are teaching them what to do and how to behave. We already talked about crate games. We already talked about getting our puppy used to being in a crate. We don't want our dog to learn or practice bad habits in the crate. Okay, so remember we talked earlier about your puppy is most likely going to make noise when they're in the crate. Okay, we're going to give them a couple days, right, to, to get used to our place. And then if that's still happening, we might take some protocols like more exercise before we go in the kennel to help reduce that noise making. Okay, we can also give acceptable chew items in the crate. If the puppy is outside the crate and chewing on something, we can redirect their attention to an acceptable chew item. So in their crate, we'll probably have some things in there like animal, natural animal parts like we talked about, like a beef trachea, right? Cow trachea, they like those. So you can put that in their kennel, but whenever you let them out of the kennel, let's say they're going for your socks or something. In that case, you're going to redirect your puppy away from the sock and onto an acceptable chew item. Maybe it's a Kong, maybe it's a cow trachea, something like that, okay? Dogs that make noise in the crate are not allowed out until they're quiet, okay? So this is the tactic, this is the one of the first tactics we're going to do if that puppy is struggling to stop making noise in the kennel, okay? So if the puppy gets used to being let out anytime they make noise, they're always going to make noise, right? So this can be difficult, but let's say you're in your room, you're going to get your puppy out of the kennel, they start making noise, maybe they're anticipating you coming over there stop, turn around, start walking away. Once that puppy's quiet again, you can turn around, start moving back to that kennel. If your puppy's quiet, as you get up to it, just let them out. Good to go, right? But if your puppy starts hooting and hollering, making all this noise, you're going to stop, turn around, walk away again. So you might have to do that a couple times until your puppy gets the concept that, hey, being quiet is what gets you out, okay? If you make a bunch of noise, you know, you're not going to be getting out uh, yet, okay? So you want to make that solidified in your dog's mind as early as possible. Then remember what we talked about earlier, what the dog is able to practice is how they're going to behave long term, okay? All right, slide 21, we're talking about housebreaking and potty training, okay? We did do a deep dive on potty training in Pack Talk Podcast episode 2, but let's talk about it here as well. So first, we're, we will be using a crate to help us with housebreaking, okay? Uh, that's going to help us manage our dog's time. <clears throat> and also, most dogs don't really like going potty, <clears throat> excuse me, where they're, where they're laying at or in their area. So that can be advantageous for us. Not all dogs, but, but most dogs, okay? One of the things that's going to help us with the housebreaking and the potty training is that each time we take our dog out of the crate, we're gonna take them outside to go potty, okay? This is gonna start working to create a habit that there is no potty inside the house. So this is starting to set up a routine, a schedule for us with our puppy, okay? So the routine is every time you come out of your crate, you start going outside to go potty. Also, before and after every major event, we take them outside to go potty. So let's say, you know, we fed them breakfast in their kennel. We take them out of their crate. We take them outside. We let them go potty. We go back in the house. They're in their X-Pen for a little bit. Now it's time to go for a walk. So we take them out of their X-Pen, take them to go potty, then take them on a walk. After the walk, we take them to go potty again because that is the major event is the walk, okay? So just think about it like that. Before and after every major event of the day, we're taking them outside to go potty. Also, with young puppies, you just want to get them on a schedule, a potty schedule, as soon as possible. So what you're going to want to do is if you're going to be in the house for a couple hours, make sure that you break up that time and you get your puppy outside to go potty, even if you're just bringing them back inside to go to their X-Pen or something like that. All right. Never leave your puppy unattended. So we talked a little bit about routine and schedule, but also supervision. Okay, so never leave your puppy unattended. If your puppy's in the X-Pen or in their crate, they're not unattended, even if you're not right there. But if they're out in the house, this is definitely when you need to have that drag line on them so you can easily get to it and 
guide them if you need to, but you're also not going to leave them unattended because that's setting you up for failure. It's setting you up for your puppy to start potting in your house, which if they start doing that, that's going to, uh, they're going to be starting to practice pottying in the house, starting to build a habit that's against, uh, working against you and your goals. Okay. One other tactic I do recommend for potty training before bed, take your puppy for about a 20 minute walk to work everything out of their system. That can be beneficial and help you start to span overnight with, uh, without having to take your puppy potty. Okay. Do keep in mind that the first several weeks that your puppy has come home to you, you're probably going to have to get up once or twice each night where you break up that night at least in half or into thirds and give your puppy a potty break. Your puppy is just too young to be able to hold it for a full eight hours or however long you like to sleep. Okay. So keep that in mind. We got to build a routine. The easiest way to build a routine is before and after we, we before and after the, the crate time, we're going potty before and after any major event in the day. We're going potty. Okay. Uh, we're not leaving the puppy unattended. We're starting to build that schedule where there's certain times where it's going to be reliable that we're going potty throughout the day. Okay. And then before bed, we do want to make sure we take that 20 minute walk so that we can maximize our puppy, uh, getting everything out of their system before we're in bed for the night. One other tip for housebreaking and potty training, we want to remove excess space in the crate by using a divider. Remember when we talked about equipment, I told you I like the Midwest Life Stages kennel. I get the single door with the divider. Okay, make sure the puppy can stand up, turn around and lay down comfortably. Other than that, start dividing that space out to reduce the possibility of your puppy going potty in the kennel. Okay, one thing I didn't put on the slide here, but that's important to note, pee pads, potty pads, a lot of people want to use those. That's basically encouraging your puppy to potty in your house. So I don't recommend using potty pads. I would recommend implementing a routine like we talked about, implementing a schedule and making sure you have proper supervision of your puppy so that you can create the proper habit of going potty outside instead of inside. Okay. Next slide, slide number 22. We're talking about healthy separation, which we have touched on earlier today. But healthy separation, remember, is teaching the puppy to be by itself. The puppy must have alone time every day so that it does not develop a problem being by itself. Remember, your puppy came from a litter in most cases, right? Not all cases, but in most cases, your puppy came from a litter. So now we have to get your puppy used to being by itself. You're not going to be home all the time with it your entire life. So another reason why your puppy needs to be by itself. We do not want to, to induce any type of separation anxiety. That's why from day one of getting our puppy home, we're going to be having healthy separation time. We can use a kennel or an X-Pen for this. It must be in a separate room from the family. Okay. So if the family is in the living room and the X-Pen's in the living room, <coughs> When I'm doing some healthy separation time, I'll put my puppy in the kennel that's back in, in the bedroom or, or a different room, if that makes sense. If the family is outside or if the family is in one of the, the rooms of the house and the X-Pen is in the living room, I might put the puppy in the X-Pen because it's not in direct contact with people. So you have to be conscious and deliberate about building that healthy separation into your routine so your puppy isn't used to you being around all the time and is not always getting attention from other people. Okay. Dogs that are always with the owner can develop an unhealthy obsession with never being alone. Even if you're retired, you know, even if you don't have to work or anything like that, you still need to make sure that your dog has healthy separation, which means you have to take deliberate action throughout the day to not be with your dog, to not be with your puppy. Okay. Dogs that develop an unhealthy separation with never being alone, that can lead to frustration, destruction, stress, and extreme separation anxiety, which we've all heard about. We've all seen the pictures people post of their dog chewing up their house or something like that. We don't want that. Obviously it's not going to be beneficial for us. Okay. All right. Moving on next slide. Number 23, we're talking about motivation. 
This is another aspect of management that often gets overlooked is, is motivation, okay? If your puppy is out doing whatever they want to all the time, it won't reason why it should listen to you or adhere to you, okay? We do want the dog, the puppy, to heavily desire working for you. We do want to control what the puppy gets excited about and gets exci- and gets into, okay? Things that activities that they're doing. So in order to do that, using the kennel or the exercise pen to manage your puppy's time, in turn, will increase their motivation for you and your desires. Going back to the routine we talked about with the potty training, right? Basically, if I'm not able to supervise my dog, it's going to be in an, in an X pen, <clears throat> exercise pen, or kennel, okay? If I'm supervising the dog, it might be around the house with me. So that in and of itself is going to start tweaking this motivation in your favor okay but just keep in mind if your puppy's out doing whatever they want to do all the time it won't reason why it should listen to you or adhere to you and sometimes that applies to adult dogs too right so your adult dogs still need to preserve that level of motivation for you all right next slide number 24 leash walking okay this is a big one but management's going to help us incorporate this leash pulling is natural to the dog due to opposition reflex. We don't want our dogs to practice this at all, okay? Remember how we talked about earlier leashes and collars, right? Uh, We talked about slip leads. We talked about harnesses. If I have a puppy in a harness, I'm not too worried about leash pulling because I do like puppies pulling into harnesses. I like adult dogs pulling into harnesses. But if I have... (coughs) <coughs> Excuse me. If I have a collar or a slip lead on, I want to not allow my puppy to pull on that at all because I want them to not even build the habit of pulling against things that are around their neck. Okay, so how are we going to start reducing the leash pulling or not even allowing the leash pulling to happen? We're going to be using food lures to manage and teach proper leash walking, proper leash manners. Okay, so We're going to reward our dog for maintaining a loose leash. We're not going to allow them to pull by using a food lure to move them back to a loose leash position. So let's say you're walking with your dog. You need to have your bait bag with your food rewards ready to go. Okay. If your dog is maintaining a loose leash, you can just say good and give them a food reward wherever they're at. Okay. If you want your dog walking to your, uh, next to you on your left side, for example, you can say good and you can have your food reward position down your left leg and then your puppy can come to the location of your hand with your food reward and take it from there that's going to build reinforcement history of being on your left side so that's going to help you in the future if your puppy's pulling on that leash you can stop walking take out a food lure show it to their nose and then bring them back to you so that leash is loose before you say good and give it to them okay so this is going to take lots of repetitions but the main thing is Don't let your puppy practice pulling on the leash with a collar. If you need to just move around from point A to point B, this is when a harness could be advantageous. You can put that harness on. You can let your puppy pull into that harness a little bit. No big deal there because we can use that later in other training for building up motivation uh, and frustration for certain uh, things we're going to be doing. Okay. All right, next slide, slide number 25, we're starting to touch on socialization again. We talked about this briefly earlier, but we're going to have a little bit deeper conversation right here about it. So socialization is providing your puppy with positive experiences and close proximity to new people, places, and things. This does not mean that your puppy must have direct contact with new people, places, and things. You should be reducing your thresholds and increasing your puppy's comfort level okay let me just touch on that real quick so your threshold is going to be your distance to distraction okay so think about it if i'm out on the street on my sidewalk and uh, my puppy's nervous of a trash can you know that's two driveways or you know 20 feet away from me for example maybe i need to start socializing my puppy to that trash can so i'll be out there You know, I'll be asking my puppy for some eye contact or I'll be showing some food to their nose and having them lure around with that food, chase that food around a little bit. I'll be saying good or yes and then delivering the food reward. 
Okay. And then, uh, as time goes on, it's not going to be the first day probably, but you know, after several sessions, I'm going to start reducing my distance to that trash can until my puppy is super comfortable being right next to that trash can. My puppy doesn't need to have direct contact with the trash can, but it should be comfortable laying down right next to it, not really caring about it. Okay. So that's what socialization is overall. And that trash can scenario, that trash can could be any distraction, could be other dogs, could be people, could be, you know, being at the hardware store, some kind of lumber cart going by. Just imagine that that is the trash can scenario we talked about. So over time, you're going to reduce your distance to that distraction, reduce your threshold so that your puppy is not nervous about being around that, doesn't really care about being around that. That's what socialization is. Again, your puppy doesn't have to have direct contact with things. So you don't have to have people petting your puppy. You don't have to have dogs playing with your puppy. That is a whole nother level of socialization, which I do recommend getting into. But the, the primary thing that you should be focused about, positive experiences in close proximity to new people, places, and things. Okay. Socialization should be maintained through the life of your dog. <coughs> so something that's very common it is common for a young puppy to be socialized then to stop getting socialized as a dog gets older and then there's going to be issues later on don't let this happen to you once you get your puppy at a very healthy and normal socialization level you don't have to socialize so much as you've been doing with them being a puppy but once a month make sure you're exposing them to these different things at a minimum you know that should uh, maintain that socialization long term throughout the life of your dog okay keep your socialization sessions short and fun so again 15 minutes here 15 minutes there no big deal okay make sure your puppy's having a good time <clears throat> in the session with the best time possible okay if your puppy's starting to get burnt out if your puppy is slowing down and their engagement with you and their interaction with you that means you're probably going too long. So go ahead and cut that session, okay? Incorporate engagement games into your socialization work. So what I recommend is you go out to wherever you're doing socialization, whether it be your driveway, your sidewalk, the hardware store, the park, whatever, and you start getting your puppy to give you eye contact. Once they give you eye contact, you say yes, right? You back up, you have them come to your hand for a food reward, or you say good, then you just hand them a food reward from, from your hand wherever they're at, okay? So getting that eye contact, you can do that by just waiting for them to, to make eye contact with you, to mark that, then reward it. Or you can say their name, uh, buddy, right? Say his name, looks at you, good, reward, that type of scenario. Those are two ways you're going to start establishing that eye contact. But it, doing that eye contact engagement game, that's what I would be doing for my socialization. So I'm doing my eye contact, I'm doing my rewarding, I'm just going to different locations and getting close to different people, places, and things, right? Reducing my thresholds, reducing my distances to those distractions as I'm doing my engagement games, okay? So I hope that makes sense. Don't allow your puppy to rehearse unwanted behaviors. So if you go out for socialization and your puppy starts barking at everybody, you probably want to increase your distance from those distractions, Try to establish eye contact at a greater distance from those distractions where they're not barking or cut the session, figure out what exactly is going on. Okay. And then you can make a new game plan to accomplish that uh, as time goes on here. All right. So that's the quick and easy on socialization. We did do a full podcast on socialization if you want more of a deep dive on that. All right. Handling drills, puppies. Uh, next slide 26. Remember that you need to prepare your puppy for being handled. This goes hand in hand with socialization, all right? Um, but think about vet visits, grooming, dog chiropractors, right? Big thing in today's world and very beneficial. So you want to prepare your dog for all these types of things. So think about what's going to happen at the vet visit. Think about what's going to happen at the groomer. Think about what's going to happen with the chiropractor, which means you want to handle their ears, handle their mouth handle their teeth, open their mouth, close their mouth, right? If they need medicine one day, you're going to need to be able to do that. Uh, sticking your thumbs into their mouth, right? Not excessively, but you know, getting your, getting your thumbs in there. Like if you're pushing a pill down their, down their throat, 
inspecting their ears, their tongue, their toes, their legs, tails, everything, right? So you want to handle these things. And let's say you're doing that, for example, with their mouth, you put your hands over their muzzle. Good, right? You let go, you grab a reward, you give it to them. Put your hand over their muzzle, pull up their cheeks a little bit. Good, right? You let go, get a food reward, give it to them. So that's how you're going to start handling them and getting them comfortable with these different handling drills. Okay. You're basically messing with one of their body parts. If they're tolerating that for a short duration of time, initially good, right? You, you mark that with the word good, grab a food reward, give it to them. And then you go back to messing with them again. And then as time goes on, you're going to increase your duration of handling them in these certain ways. So again, think vet visits, think grooming, think chiropractor. Those are the main ones that people are going to need to mess with them. So that's checking their spine, checking their legs. You're going to want to do all that. Okay. Uh, make sure that you familiarize your puppy with any equipment that you may need to use, right? So leashes, collars, harnesses, vests, muzzles, right? Anything like that. And what I like to do with this is, is make a game out of it. So just like when I was doing the, the, the vet visit handling, where I'm grabbing their muzzle, pulling up their cheeks a little bit, good, letting go, grabbing a food reward, giving it to them. With a muzzle use, I'll basically have the muzzle. And if my puppy is like sniffing the muzzle because they're interested in it, they've never seen one before, I say, good, I get a food reward, I give it to them, right? So now my puppy's starting to learn that, oh, this thing is kind of interesting this piece of equipment here. And it's giving me food rewards, which I like. So your puppy will keep checking out the muzzle. You would just increase your criteria to give them a reward. And what that would look like is, you know, instead of sniffing it, now they have to put their nose just into the center of it. Good reward. Now they have to stick their whole muzzle into it. Good reward. And you just increase your criteria for them getting a reward with that piece of equipment. And you can do that with any piece of equipment. You just have to think about your slow progression with that. Okay. So another thing, lure them around with food, play with them with food, make them comfortable with the handling or the new equipment. You can do happy visits at your vet office where you basically go to your vet office. They let you go into a room. You can put your puppy up on the table, lots of rewards, having a good time, take them off, take them out. Good to go. You can do it in like five minutes. Okay. So talk to your vet if you'd like to do that, I'm sure that a grooming salon would let you do that as well or a chiropractor. Okay. So make sure you guys talk with your people that you're going to be using and, uh, think about those things that can really help you with socialization and long-term good behavior in these situations. All right. Slide number 27. Here's just an example daily schedule. Okay. I know what you guys are going to say about this one. You're going to say, no one's going to work on the schedule. Okay. Just think about this as being your weekend. Okay. If you're going to work, obviously the time that you're at work, you're not going to be home. So your puppy's going to be in the kennel. Okay. But here's just an example, daily schedule, six o'clock in the morning, <clears throat> you wake up, you take your puppy potty. Okay. 630, you're feeding them breakfast in their kennel. 7 a.m., you're taking them for their morning walk and a, and a little training session incorporated with your walk. That's the way I like doing most of my training is incorporating it with a walk because I can get the benefits of both those things happening at the same time. 9 a.m., you let your puppy go potty again. Then you put them either in their kennel or their exercise pen for that healthy separation practice. Remember, we talked about that. So you need to make sure you're doing it every single day. 12 p.m., three hours later, you're going, uh, taking your puppy potty, take a short walk and training session incorporated together. 1 PM going potty again. Now they're in their kennel and X pen again, or X pen again, again, healthy separation. 4 PM, you take them to go potty again, do a little training session. Could, could be in your yard real quick. Okay. 5 PM, you're going potty dinner in crate 5 30 PM evening walk training session incorporated 8 p.m. is at nighttime shorter walk than normal that's going to be helping pump everything out of their system for overnight 8 30 p.m. potty then in kennel for night now if this puppy was less than probably 12 maybe 13 weeks old I might have to get up at like 11 p.m. 2 a.m. or so 
to uh, take the puppy potty again, okay? It's going to depend on your puppy, how they're doing with their potty training, okay, as to how many times you wake up in the middle of the night. But I can almost guarantee you that when you first get your puppy, at least for the next several weeks, you're going to have to get up overnight and let him go potty, okay? Now, let's say you had to work. Everyone's work schedule is different, but let's say you work from like 10 to 3, for example, basically right before you go to work, you take your puppy potty, you put them in their kennel. When you get home from work, you take them potty, and then you go from there based on what you're doing, okay? So obviously, this daily schedule is someone that's going to be home, okay? A lot of people work from home now, so this might be doable for a lot of people, or maybe this is just a weekend schedule. And as time goes on, you should be you know, because this is a pretty busy schedule with the puppy. But as time goes on, you shouldn't be doing this much work for your puppy, uh, you know, as their potty training develops. That's the kind of stuff you're thinking about. Okay. All right, next slide, slide number 28. This is going to be your priorities with your puppy and their training. Okay, first priority is going to be that potty training. Remember, we talked about that earlier. That's going to be your routine, your schedule, and your supervision that are the critical components there. Make sure that before and after every major event, you take your puppy potty so they are building the habit of going potty outside, not inside, okay? You might have to adjust some feeding or some watering schedules if there's some troubleshooting steps that you need to take. You can always reach out to us if you need some help troubleshooting your potty scenarios, okay? Second priority is gonna be engagement. That's gonna be your eye contact. Now, honestly, with this, what I prefer <coughs> is that my puppy volunteers their eye contact. I'm not begging them for it. So remember earlier how I said you can ask, you know, for the eye contact by saying your puppy's name. Buddy, your dog looks at you. Good. Reward them. That is okay, but preferably I'm just out in the yard with Buddy, for example. I'm waiting on Buddy just to voluntarily look at me. As soon as he does, good. Reward him. What that does is it opens up some more neural pathways in his brain to where he's like registering that looking at me is a rewarding thing. So he'll start looking at me more often. And then as time goes on, I can reduce my rewards as far as it goes in the eye contact realm. Okay. All right. Third priority is going to be leash walking. Remember we talked about leash pulling, how to avoid that, how to work against that. So that's my third priority. Uh, fourth priority is getting that socialization in. And just because I'm saying these in order, uh, you can blend all these together. Like with the potty training, you can be working on potty training, engagement, leash walking, socialization all at the same time. Okay, so don't think you have to get one accomplished before you go to the next one. But socialization is going to be next, starting to expose my puppy to a variety of people, places, and things while giving my puppy positive experiences and close proximity to them, and then maintaining that as my puppy gets older, okay? Fifth priority is going to be my obedience muscle memory. So I'm going to start luring my puppy into sits, into downs, into come commands, onto the spot. You know, anything that I want my puppy to be able to do obedience-wise, I'm going to start luring that and getting their body used to moving into those positions, okay? And then uh, priority number six is going to be continuing in the overall training progression, which all of this is kind of built into that. But, uh, what we're going to be doing in a future podcast is it's going to be another lecture series where we're going to deep dive into the training progression from start to finish all the details along every step of the way. So you guys can do that at home, but this puppy, uh, training, handling, selection, raising, uh, lecture series. This is, t you know, somewhat of a prerequisite to that because a lot of people are getting a puppy. You want to make sure you're prepared for that. Okay. So this is kind of your, your cheat sheet right here. All right. So if I was getting a puppy, these are the priorities that I'd be focused on. Okay. As soon as they hit about 15 weeks or so, now I'm continuing in my overall training progression. Okay. The people that I work with, I have the honor of working with. These are the things that we're focused on. Okay. Just to recap everything, you know, we talked about puppy selection, puppy raising, puppy training. So go back, review this. If you're, if you're listening to this, 
go to YouTube, either Pack Talk Podcast or Canine Revolution Dog Training YouTube, and you know, search for this uh, episode so you can get the uh, PowerPoint and you know, write some notes down. Start getting your game plan together for when you get a puppy. Okay, and then if you need help with that, you can reach out to us. We'll be more than happy to provide some guidance on what to do with your puppy and what steps to take, which we do all the time. And I'm very happy that we've started putting out puppy information probably the past two years on what to do with your puppy, things like that, in the podcast format and the YouTube. And I've been visiting with a lot of people recently. They got the X-Pin set up. They got the kennel set up. They got the interaction toys separate from the self-entertainment toys. So, you know, people are putting this into work, this material, and uh, it's it's working out really good for them, okay? So take this information, implement it, and again, make some adjustments based on you and your family, okay? But let's talk about our sponsors for Pack Talk Podcast. First of all, we've got Canine Revolution Dog Training, right? Uh, you can email us at info at caninerevolutiondogtraining.com. You can call us or text us, 843-213-213. Two six seven six. Okay, we've got a large staff ready to serve you and your dogs from across the United States. Okay, we've got board and train programs. That's the main thing that we're doing. We've got puppy training. We've got in-home consultations. Those are complimentary for people in our immediate area, which is the South Carolina Low Country. We've got uh, virtual assistance we can provide to you. Uh, we've got lifetime support for you and your dog. Okay, we got you for life. So hit us up, let us help you, all right? Also sponsored by Canine Revolution Apparel, which is on Amazon. We try to make it easy for everybody. Everyone likes Amazon, so do we. So you can visit our Amazon store by searching Canine Revolution Apparel. We've got shirts, we've got hoodies, we've got beanies, we've got mugs. We get a lot of comments on our logo. People like our logo, so we've got some logos available on the Amazon store if you want to wear some logoed gear, okay? Another one of our sponsors, Origin USA. That's going to be at originusa.com. American source materials, American made goods, okay? So everything from Origin USA is sourced in America, right? They make jeans, even the rivets on the jeans are from America. The cotton for the jeans is from America. So I mean, this company right here, we truly believe in, all right? But they've got jeans, they've got boots, they've got hoodies, shirts, hunt gear, martial arts gear, exercise gear. You can go to originusa.com. You can put a bunch of things in your cart. You can use discount code SINGER101 at checkout. That's going to get you 10% off of your order, okay? Next sponsor is Jocko Fuel, jockofuel.com. That's going to be American sourced ingredients American-made supplements, all right? So just like with the Origin USA stuff, with supplements, now these are being sourced in America. So there's no better way to support the American economy than by, you know, getting things, getting supplements from a company that's sourcing everything in America and making it in America, okay? So they have milk protein. They've got pre-workout, energy drinks, which I just had one right here, which is the Jocko Go Iced Tea Lemonade. That's one of my favorite flavors. They've got the greens, green powders, kind of like uh, AG1, but better, you know. Uh, they've got creatine. They've got joint support, which is basically just a, you know, couple of uh, tablets you take every day to support your joints. They've got immunity support. So we're, we're it's been sick season, right? It's 2023 in the fall. There's a lot of sicknesses going around. You can get that immunity support to help you recover from one if you get sick or to prevent you from getting sick, okay? They've got anti-aging matrix matrices to help you with your longevity goals, all right? So if you go to jockofuel.com, you can use discount code CANINEREVOLUTION at checkout for 10% off. It also supports the podcast, okay? Last sponsor we'll talk about today is canine super supplements all right you can go to www.caninesupersupplements.com <coughs> that's the letter k the number nine super supplements.com these are the highest quality american made supplements for your dog so we already talked about how to support you with the jocko fuel now we're talking about how you can support your dog their main supplements are the joint supplement 
helping your dog, your dog's joints. The multivitamin helps your dog's immunity, right? And other functions, other bodily functions. The puppy formula, which we were talking about puppies today, your puppy needs those enhanced nutrients. That's what the puppy formula provides them. Then the weight gainer. There's a lot of dogs that are hard gainers. They have super fast metabolism. You can try to feed them a bunch of kibble and they're not going to gain any weight. The weight gainer is proven to add weight to dogs that are hard gainers. We've done it with uh, two dogs recently ourselves. Okay. So use the discount code canine revolution at checkout. That'll give you 15% off your order (coughs) and support the podcast at the same time. Okay. Don't forget visit pack talk podcast and canine revolution dog training on YouTube. We have a lot of videos. We talked about a lot of stuff today, but the videos that we put out, we try to supplement our audio and our visual uh, information with showing you what we're doing with different dogs to give you a better idea of how to do it at home. Okay. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out. Otherwise, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. This is Pack Talk Podcast out.